All right, welcome. If you are visiting with us for the first time, we are so glad that you are here. Please fill out a connect card in your pew and put it in the offering bin on your way out. We also have a welcome bag for you in the lobby. Another announcement, Family Fun Night is August 14th at Little Chickies Park. Please sign up on the bulletin board if you can hand out ice cream or help set up. Awana, a Wednesday night Bible club will be starting here in October. We will need lots of volunteers. Please see Pastor Vaughn for more info. Plus there's tons of stuff on the table out in the lobby as well. There will be a rummage sale meeting next Sunday, August 15th at 11.30 a.m. for everyone who wants to volunteer. Also, the cutoff date for bringing items is next Sunday, the 15th. So get those closets cleaned out and get it here. All right, are there any other announcements that I've missed? All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this time to come together as a, as a church family to worship you. We pray that we'll set aside the busyness of the week and our plans and focus on you to worship you, to show you the love that you so richly deserve, and to um, be fed from your word today and from your music and from all that has been planned Lord, we thank you for all you've done for us, and we pray that we would help us to give back to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to hear some camp highlights from Mr. Justin Neidig. Good morning. Um, we are planning throughout the month of August to provide updates from Camp Eligua, what is happening with the uh, camping ministry this summer. So uh, I guess I drew the short straw and I'm first. Um, I just want to share a brief a testimony of what God was doing at uh, camp through uh, our camp week. So Tracy and I, Tracy Miller and I, we were wearing our camp Smurf shirts for this year. This is the camp theme shirt for the staff. Um, we have the privilege of co-directing the eighth grade wilderness camp. Um, which uh, happened the 25th of July through the 31st of July. And um, we were blessed with 32 campers, 16 boys, 16 girls, uh, eight fantastic staff, and um, had a really, really great week. Um, the theme for the summer is Philippians 3.14. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Um, and so we were looking at pressing on. Uh, our theme was press on because we said that's pretty good. So we were looking at when your circumstances are not ideal, we have a choice to make and how are we going to respond. Monday we were looking at when we're enduring hardship and difficulty and we chose to press on in obedience following the example of Noah and Ruth. Uh, we took a look on Tuesday of enduring doubt and complaining and the choice to press on in faith following the example, example of Peter and not the Israelites with the Moses in the desert. On Wednesday, we took a look at uh, enduring fear and overwhelming odds and choosing to press on in courage following the example of David and Esther. On Thursday, we took a look at enduring pain and suffering, and we chose to press on in strength following the example of Paul and Job. And then finally, on Friday, we looked at enduring exhaustion and burnout and chose to press on in faithfulness following the example of Samuel and Elijah and then of course Thursday night was our consecration service and all of these aspects obedience and faith courage strength and faithfulness attest to the magnificence of our Lord Jesus Christ and so we focused on him and pressing on in obedience to the cross and giving it all for us and paying for us so we were blessed to see um, two young men give their lives to the Lord to uh, recommit, rededicate, a lot of clarity, uh, a lot of blessings in that, and uh, an opportunity to see a lot of confusion uh, taken care of and cleared up in terms of you know, spiritual confusion. Uh, we have an incredibly spiritually mature staff, which was such a blessing because uh, right off the starting bat, I think Sunday night, we were dealing with some, some uh, spiritual warfare, kind of... Uh, you know, concerning things of what the kids, the campers bring, the baggage that they bring with them and that what they have to overcome, but their perseverance 
even to get to our week was, was remarkable and a great encouragement um, to us. Also, the idea that uh, we've seen a lot of growth. One of the blessings and highlights for me was uh, there was a young lady we had there last year, and she was very confused, uh, very confused about a lot of things, wasn't sure if she would... Uh, had a relationship with the Lord, and at the end of the week, we asked them to uh, write a letter to their future self, and I, uh, I have those on my desk at home, and somewhere mid-year, I'll, I'll mail them to them so they remember what, what they learned at camp, what God spoke to them at camp, and as they sit on my desk uh, at home, I'll, I'll take one off and put it on the bottom, and I just keep praying my way down through all the, all the cards throughout the year, and I set hers aside specifically because I knew that she was really struggling, and uh, a lot of prayer for her, and the beautiful thing was the Lord brought her back. We had her a second time, and what a remarkable difference. I mean, totally solid in her face, a leader, not just among the other campers, but a leader in her, her, uh, her beliefs in the Lord, and just very vocal, and it was like, wow, what an answer to prayer, and what a personal blessing to me that the Lord answered those prayers. Uh, and of course, the weather was beautiful. Uh, we were able to actually do everything we scheduled, which doesn't normally happen because we're wilderness. Everything is outside, so we're very dependent on the weather, uh, and that was a, a great testimony uh, that we could do everything. And then uh, last, I would just like to thank everyone for your, your prayers. I think gr God, the God's grace was evident in the healing in my body, but then also the fact that the weather cooperated, so it was not a, a miserable week for me physically. So I just want to give him the honor and the glory and the praise for that. But uh, a lot of good things happening. We're hoping to hear from uh, Phil and Mindy and Dave and Patty later on, but just a lot to be thankful for that the Lord is active and at work in the lives of young people at Camp Ulejua. So praise the Lord. What's the target for? We're going to see in just a minute, but I'm glad you noticed that target. So this summer, we've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit, so we're going to put them up there, and we'll ask the adults to join us today, and we're going to say the fruit of the Spirit. Are we ready? Here we go. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So today is the last fruit of the Spirit, what is self-control. So self-control is being able to guide our thoughts and our actions so we're not flying around out of control. You know, sometimes... Um, when our parents talk to us at home, maybe like pick up our toys or clean our room, sometimes we don't stay under control real well. Or have you ever fought with your brothers or sisters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we yell, sometimes we hit. Have you ever hit each other? Yeah, thanks for being honest. I appreciate that, yeah. And that's, that's when we're out of control. So the Lord wants us to stay in control. And if we think about this target, Linda was asking about this target. If we think about this target, and we put here in the middle, we put Jesus. The problem is when we're not in control, we're not really showing what Jesus is really like. But Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to live as, inside of us to help us to be in control. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think with this balloon I can hit this target? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> okay, are we ready? So I'm... Watch, I'm going to aim, and I'm going to try to hit that target with this balloon. You ready? I didn't hit it, did I? Because the balloon was what? Out of control. See, the adults knew that. The balloon was out of control. Yeah. Yeah, if you do that, there's no way the balloon can't be out of control. But this little toilet paper roll is going to represent the Holy Spirit today and represent self-control. No, I didn't want to, I, no toilet paper on it. So we're going to try this again. But we're going to add to our balloon, and our balloon is like us. It's out of control a lot of times. It yells, it screams, it hits. 
does all those things because we have a hard time staying in control. But that's why God gave us the Holy Spirit. So we're going to try doing something, and then we're going to try to hit our target. So let's see here. So I have a helper who's coming. Now who does the balloon represent? The balloon represents who? Us. Very good. And who do we need to help us stay in control? The Holy Spirit. So, when we ask Jesus to come into our heart, the Holy Spirit comes and lives with inside of us. He's there with us. So, we need the Holy Spirit. So, this is us, and we're going to add the Holy Spirit. This is Mr. Don. Appreciate him helping us today. I might have to get a different helper. <laughs> there we go. So who's the balloon? Us. That's right. And who have we added to us? The Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. Ready? Oh, look at that. See that? And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He helps us to be able to have self-control. So that's our lesson about self-control. You can come and get a paper, and you can pick up either a fruit snack or some cookies. One. I'm going to ask you to stand and sing with me. We're going to sing Jesus, only Jesus.
The next song that we are gonna sing is going to be the theme song for August because it's a passage of scripture that Pastor Vaughn would like us to learn. It is from Psalm 25. Um, this is not an old song. I'm, gonna, I'm saying that because I remember it from my youth group days. So it's not an old song, okay? <laughs> All right, it's called Unto Thee, O Lord. seated and children ages four to seven are now dismissed for children's church let's pray dear Heavenly Father we thank you for this day and again we thank you for all that you have given to us we thank you for the ministry at camp and for all of the volunteers who have given of their time of their counseling of their energy um, and we we thank you so much for the ministry of the camp and we pray that you will bless it we pray for markley who's there right now that she is having a wonderful weekend for her first weekend of camp um, and again we thank you for all those people who give to make that possible as we give now or think of our giving for our offering we pray that we would um, remember all that you have given to us and and joyfully give back to you of our, our tithes our offerings of our time of our thoughts Help us to be focused on you and your will. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to continue by singing Confidence.
Cause you fight for me I'll be a champion Amen. Thank you, Wendy, for, and our praise team for leading us this morning. Certainly appreciated all those who have prayed for Virginia this week. Uh, her surgery went well. Doctor accomplished everything he wanted to. She was in intensive care for 24 hours. She was moved out to a regular room, and then she faced some problems and was put back in intensive care. And uh, that's where she is. They, uh, her blood pressure uh, went very, very low. So praise the Lord, her blood pressure has stabilized, and she's doing well, but she has pneumonia in her right lung. And uh, so, uh, of course, when you've had your chest cut open and then you're coughing and all that, uh, that's, she's suffering some pain through that, but uh, thank the Lord for morphine that is helping her. So, again, we continue. I appreciate your prayers, and we know that God is there and taking care. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them this morning to 1 Samuel. We're in 1 Samuel, and I hope you brought your Bibles today. And uh, we're encouraging you each week to bring your Bibles, open them, mark them, write things down. Last week, we talked about that story that we all know of David and Goliath. And somebody came to me and had a really great question this week about that story. They said, Pastor, you know, who, who are we in that story? Are we David who slew the giant? And I'm going to tell you, no, we are not David. That's not who we are in that story. We are those Israelites, Saul and all his people, who wouldn't go down and fight the giant. They were what? They were hiding. They were afraid. They needed a Savior to come forth who would be their savior, who would take their place and fight sin. And that's where we are. We're all sinners. And we need a what? We need a savior who will come and fight for us and slay that giant of sin. So we're not David in that story. We are those Israelites who are afraid, who need a savior. The Old Testament always, always again is a reflection of what is yet to come in the New Testament. And Jesus Christ came to what? To be our warrior, to be our savior, to slay sin for us because there's no way we can slay sin ourselves. We needed a savior. So if you take anything away from last week's message, I was glad that question was asked. So I can come back and just review that story a little bit and remind you who we are. And so today, we're going to look in, in part two of this series on the life of David about four killer giants that we all face. 
These are four giants in our lives that will often cause us to crash and burn in our walk with God. And here they are. Their anger, their fear, isolation, and rejection. And we're going to see that today in the story that we're going to be looking at in this part of David's life. These four conditions can cause you to crash through every moral and every ethical boundary you've set for your spiritual self. Let me say that again because I think this is important. These four conditions, these four giants can cause you to crash through every moral and ethical boundary that you've set for yourself. Now let me remind you, the, the series, this series is called David, A Man After God's Own Heart. I do believe that David was a man after God's own heart. But we're going to see this morning that fear and anger and isolation and rejection caused David to walk right through boundaries that he had set for himself. I mean, we saw, and we've been, we're memorizing Psalms 25, his trust was in who? His trust was in God when he faced that giant. His trust is that God would deliver him. Now, he was 15 years old, and now we're looking at his life, and at this point, he is now 22 years old. 22 years old when these giants are going to take care of him. And you know, I can relate to this story myself. I relate to it. I relate to it. I was charged with plagiarism and in my preaching by a man that I had hired and I highly respected. And uh, it came before the elders of the church. And uh, one of the elders approached me and I lied to him. I crossed a moral boundary that I had set in my life and said I would never do. I lied. Why? Because I was in fear. I felt rejected. I felt then that self, I was isolated from the others in the ministry, from my ministry team. And so I understand this. I understand what that means to go through that. I was angry. I was very angry. And if you're sitting here this morning, the reality is you probably can relate. I've watched Christians become angry and bitter over being hurt, and then they lash out and their walk with God is destroyed. I've watched people who've been hurt isolate themselves. What happens when we're hurt is we move away or we have a relationship. Instead of trying to work through, we have hurt and we move away from that other person and we isolate ourselves. We have fear. We live in fear of others so we won't be hurt again. We feel rejected. Nobody cares. Nobody loves me. Nobody will be my friend but sometimes you're blocking that because of your isolation. You're blocking that because you've closed off to all relationships. And that's where we find David at 22 years old. Let's pray and then we're going to look at scripture this morning and walk through this story. Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom. Lord, every one of us here today I believe at one time or another, fight these giants in our lives. Lord, we, we become angry, and sometimes we become angry at you, or we become angry at others. And in the midst of that anger, Father, we'll cross barriers, we'll say things, we'll do things that we've said we'll never do. Or, Father, we become fearful of people. We become fearful of situations, and then we withdraw. And then we isolate ourselves, and we, we said, I don't want anything to do with anybody else. And, Lord, we blame it on everybody else, but we've isolated. And, and, Lord, we've blocked all the relationships that we really need to have in our life when we isolate ourselves because of anger and, reject and fear. 
And then, Lord, rejection. There's not one of us that sometime in our life have not felt rejected. Lord, it might be between spouses we've felt rejected. It might be because of our kids or it might be because of our friends who, Father, have said things or done things. And, Lord, we just feel rejected. And sometimes, Lord, even in our own walk with you, Lord, you don't answer our prayer like we think they should be answered. Father, we pray and we pray and we pray, and it's not, re- it's not answered. And Father, we even think you reject us. And David would often in the Psalms write that. Lord, don't you hear me? Don't you care what I'm going through? And he felt like you rejected him, Father. And so every one of us in this room, if we're honest with ourselves this morning, we face these four giants in our lives. And these giants will cause us to go beyond our own moral limitations. Often, Lord, we walk across lines we've set for ourselves because of these giants. And so this morning, use the scripture to speak to our hearts, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. After that great victory with David and Goliath, you can turn, if you have your Bibles, to John, or excuse me, 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. And it says, As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So what has happened now is David has slew Goliath, and David has been invited to live in the palace. And so right away, as he's living in the palace, he builds this relationship, this kindred spirit relationship with Saul's son, Jonathan. And they become best friends. And... uh, In verse 8, we're going to see what it says. It says, As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. Listen to their song there in verse number 7. Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his what? Ten thousands. Now, here's the king of Israel, Saul. How do you think he's feeling right now? Not good. He becomes very bitter. He becomes very angry because they're what? They're raising up David instead of him. And so in verse 8, it says, And Saul was angry at this, and this saying displeased him. Uh, And they had ascribed to David 10,000, and to him only 1,000. And Saul... And you ought to underline this. And Saul eyed David from that day forward. From that day forward, they became enemies, at least from Saul's standpoint. They became enemies. Um, if you go down to verse 11, um, he had Saul would go through these rages, of, uh, this, these fits of rages, and he would call David in, the shepherd boy who played a harp, and he would have David play, play the harp for him, thinking that music would soothe him. But look what it says there in verse 11. When in the middle of David playing his lyre, playing his harp, Saul had a spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I'll pin David to the wall. But David evaded him. How many times? Twice. Just kept playing. Pretty amazing, huh? So Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. But the Lord had departed from Saul. The Lord had departed. If you go down to verse 17, Saul, because of his victory, offers him his daughter. Um, David doesn't accept. But Saul's other daughter, Michael, loved David. And they told Saul in verse 20, and the thing pleased him. And Saul thought, let me give him, let me give her to him that she may snare him and the hand of the Philistines may be against him. So he says, listen, I'll tell you what, I'll give you since she loves you, you love her, I'll give you Michael, she can marry you. But here's the price. See, in the Old Testament, the man would always 
give a down payment for his wife. And so, he, so Saul says, here's the down payment I want. And, and if you'll read down through there, you'll see in verse 25, Then Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king's desire, uh, desire desires no bride price except a hundred foreskins of the Philistines that he may be avenged of the king's enemies. So he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go find Philistines. I want you to kill them, get their foreskins, bring them back. I want a hundred. This is probably when the kids should leave, huh? <laughs> so, what does David do? He goes and kills 200 Philistines and brings the foreskins back to Saul. And so when this happens, if you look at verse 29, Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy, and you ought to mark it again, what? Continually. Now they're enemies continually. Verse 19, uh, chapter 19, And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David, and Jonathan told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. So now we're going to just keep in this story. It keeps going back. You know, Saul wants to kill David. He's already tried to kill him with two spears. Didn't work. Now he's gone and he said, listen, we're going to kill David. I want him killed. He tells Jonathan this. Jonathan pleads for Saul to, listen, don't kill, don't kill David. Look down in verse 6 of chapter 19. And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. Saul, what? Swore. As the Lord lives, he shall not put David to death. So what does he do? He says, listen, I'll tell you what. I swear I will not kill David. I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that at all. And if you move down in that same chapter, in verse 10, And Saul sought to pen David to the wall with a spear. But he eluded Saul so that he stuck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him, that he might kill him in the morning. But Michael, who's Michael? Yeah, his wife, Saul's daughter. So David's wife told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow will be, you'll be killed. So now King Saul's two kids, Jonathan and his daughter, Michael, are now on whose side? David's. So how must he have felt? He became angry. He was even more angry and more rejected. That's Saul. And look at the things that's causing Saul to do. In verse 18, now, David fled and escaped. And we get into chapter 20. And again, Jonathan warns David. So we're gonna, I'm skipping a lot because it, uh, to get to the actual portion what we're going to look at today. But if you go to verse 24 in chapter 20, it says, So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat food. The king sat on his seats at other times on the seat by the wall. Jonathan sat opposite, and Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Verse 26, Yet Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought something had happened to him. He is not clean, surely he is not clean, but on the second day, the day after the new moon, David's place was empty again. So Saul, having dinner every night, has his family all around the table, and uh, David is supposed to be living in the palace, and so Saul is wondering where David is. You can sort of understand David not showing up for dinner though, right? I mean, after all, he's tried to pin him to the wall on two different, or now four different occasions. And so he's not showing up. Um, it says, again, David's place was empty, and Saul said to Jonathan, his son, Why has not the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? And so Jonathan sort of makes an excuse and says, Listen, David earnestly asked to leave of me to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go, for the clan holds a sacrifice in the city, and my brother has commanded me to be there. So he said, listen, Jonathan says, Dad, the reason he's not here, he's at a family event in Bethlehem. 
That's why he's or in Bethlehem. That's why he's not here. Verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. He didn't like that answer. He didn't accept that answer. And he said to him, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. Whenever I read that, I wonder if his wife was sitting at the table when he says that. You son of a perverse and rebellious woman, do I know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on this earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore, send and bring to me him, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul, again, what did he do? He hurled his spear now at his own son for siding with David. And so this exchange then happens. David go, or Saul goes out into the field. David and him talk, and he said, Listen, Dad is so irritated with you, you just need to leave town. So that's what he does. He leaves, and that brings us to our text for today, chapter 21 and chapter 22. So you can imagine 22 years old. Think about this. He's 22 years old. He's been brought to the palace. Four times the king has tried to kill him. And what does he do? He runs. He runs. And I believe at this point, he is facing those giants of fear, rejection, isolation. He's facing those right now. And so when we get into chapter 2, it says, Then David came to Nob, to Amalek the priest, and Amalek came to meet David trembling, and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Amalek the priest, And I'm going to stop there for a second. The question is, why are you traveling alone, David? Where's everybody? Listen, David is a warrior, even at 22 years old. He's a general. He's a warrior. And when he travels, he travels with probably a 1,000 warriors with him. But all of a sudden, he shows up here in Nob, the place where the ark is. Amalek is the priest, and he shows up here. And he said, why are you here? Why? Where's everybody? Why are you driving alone? This doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Now David lies. Look at the next verse. The king, King Saul, has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I've made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. He said, oh, I'm here. I'm here on some really important business of the king. Was that true? No. The only reason he's there is because he's afraid of the king. He's running from the king. He's rejected. And so he lies, and he said, I'm here on some business of the king. No, he's not. No, he's not. He crosses a moral boundary, I'm sure, that he had set for himself, just like we would when we get into these situations sometimes and we face these giants. He says, now then, what do you have on hand? He said, give me something to eat. I'm hungry. He said, "Uh, five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered and said, I have no common bread. I don't have any common bread. We don't have any bread right now. He said, we only have the holy bread. We're at the temple. That's the only bread that we have. If the young men have kept themselves from women, and David answered the priest, truly, women have been kept from us, as always, when I go on expeditions. So he said, we're not having relations right now. He says, you know, um, the vessels of the young men are holy, and even when an ordinary journey, how much more today will their vessels be holy? So he said, listen, I'm on an important holy journey here. I'm, on the, I'm, I'm doing something for the king. This is a, an important mission, so give me the holy bread. It's okay. Again, crosses boundaries that he should not have crossed. For there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on that day and was taken away. And so he eats the bread that he really shouldn't have eaten. 
Now, this is important. This verse, don't miss this verse, because this is going to come into play at the end of the story this morning. Now, a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. So there's this guy who will become a spy who is there. He, his, his name is Doeg, and he sees what's happening. He watches this whole experience. Then David says to Amalek, then have you here a spear or a sword at hand? Because remember, he left with what? He left the palace with nothing. He has nobody with him. He has no sword, no spear. He's running. He's isolating. He's rejected. He's angry about all of this. For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. A lie. He continues in this lie. And the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in cloth behind the ephod. If you would take that, take it, for there is none but there that is here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it to me. The very first Sunday I preached in this church, I preached to you about, remember, the swords of the past? What did they, what did they do with the swords that they won with? They took them to the temple. And so here he is. The priest said, yeah, we have a sword. It's in the temple. And it happens to be the sword that you use to do what? To kill David. Goliath, I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for correcting me. To kill Goliath. Now, have you ever been about to sin and God send something to stop you? Or to warn you? You ever been there? You ever experienced that? If we're honest, I'm sure we would all say that. And, and we're about to do something that we shouldn't do, and it's like God sends. I, I, I've been having a thought before, and the thought isn't very good, or I, I'm getting ready to do something, and all of a sudden, the phone rings and takes my attention away, and I know the phone rang at exact time because God was trying to say, Dick, don't do that, don't do that, don't go there. And I think, I think at this point... God is trying to get David's attention and say, David, don't go the direction you're going. He says, he, here's the sword. This is the sword that you used to have that great victory. Here's the sword that God allowed you to cut off the head of David. And this is a reminder to, uh, of Goliath. And this is a reminder to David you're going the wrong direction. God has used you in a great way, and he wants to continue to use you. Here's the sword as a reminder. But David doesn't pay attention. He doesn't pay attention to the warning. Just like there's been times in my life where God warns me and I don't pay attention. He's trying to get him to turn from this sin that he's just going across every boundary that he has set for himself. It says in verse 10, And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, it is, is not this David? The king of the land, did they not sing to one another and dance to him? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And David took the words to heart and was much what? What? Afraid. Fear. So here's David with the sword that he kills Goliath with. And where does he go? He goes to a Philistine stronghold. Now, does that make sense? Does that make sense at all? You know, he's, he's walking in with the sword. He had killed Goli uh, to cut off Goliath's head. And he goes here and he comes to Achish, the king of Gath, which is a stronghold of the Philistines. So he changed his behavior and pretended to be what? Insane in the hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. 
It's crazy, isn't it? But what isolation and fear and rejection, what it will do to us. And here, he's acting like a madman. He's afraid. He's afraid they're going to kill him. He's afraid they're going to kill him, but he's come to offer himself to fight in their army. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see this madman? What have you brought unto me? Do I lack madmen that you've brought me, this fellow, to behave as a madman in my presence? I love that statement. I love God's sense of humor when he writes the Bible. Here's the king of the Philistines saying, Do I need another madman? I got enough crazy men in my army. I don't need another crazy guy. He said, no, I don't, I don't want him anything. Do I like madman that you've brought me this fellow to behave in a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come unto my house? And he said, I don't want him. Get rid of him. Get rid of him. David, in chapter 22, departed from there, and he escaped to the cave of Adullam. What's he doing now? He escapes to the cave. What's that? Isolation. He's isolating from everything. He, even his enemies don't want him. You know, his own people don't want him. Saul doesn't want him. And now the, the enemies, the Philistines, they don't even want him. They don't even want him. And so he goes to a cave. Have you ever been to that point in your life? Poor little old me. Poor little me. You ever read Winnie the Pooh? Who's like that? Eeyore. Yeah, we all get to that point. We all become Eeyores, don't we? Nobody likes me. Nobody cares for me. Poor little me. That's where David is as he hides in the cave. And when his brothers and his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. I've wrote in my Bible the word intervention. He needed an intervention, didn't he? He was isolated. And so his brothers and his, father, his father's house hears about this. And they come to confront him. They come to remind him. They come to help him get back to where he needs to be. Here is an intervention. And it says, And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in the soul gathered to him. Now, that doesn't sound like a real good crew who could help you, does it? You know, they're all in debt, they're all bitter, they're all angry themselves. Um, and he would become the commander over them, and there was about 400 of them. So, really, at, at the end of where he is here in this story, he's still not in a good place. But I want to remind you something this morning. When you think of David and you think of David's greatest failure, where do we always go? Bathsheba, right? That happened when he was 50 years old. 50 years old. 28 years from, from this when he's 22. But I'll tell you, this to me would come pretty close to that failure. Because here, hear the rest of the story. Hear the rest of the story. So, chapter 22, verse 6. Now Saul heard that David was discovered and the men were with him. Saul was sitting at Gibeah under the, tam under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand and all his servants were standing about him. Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Here now, people of Benjamin, will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me? No one discloses to me 
what my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servants against me to lie and wait as that day. So man, he's feeling sorry for himself. He said, listen, he's speaking to everybody. Nobody cares what I'm going through. Nobody cares that my son's turned against me and is, is following David. Nobody cares about this. Remember that guy I told you to mark? What was his name? Doag. So he happens to be here this day. He happens to be there that day. Verse 9. Then answered Doag the Edomite, who stood by the servants of Saul. I saw the son of Jesse come to Nob to Amalek, the priest, the son of Hetub, and he inquired of the Lord for him, and he gave him provisions, and he gave him the sword of Goliath and the Philistines. He said, I, hey, hey, let me tell you something, king. I was there the day that David showed up to see the priest. I was there that day. And Amalek, the priest, helped him. He gave him food. He gave him a sword. He did all these things. The king sent a summon to Amalek, the priest, and he came. Verse 12, and Saul said, Hear now, son of Ahab, uh, Hiatub. And he answered, Here am I, Lord. And Saul said to him, What have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, that you have given him bread and sword, and have inquired of God for him, so that he has risen against me to lie wait this day? Now, He's blaming him for helping David. But remember, did he know the truth? No, he believed David's lie. He believed that David was on a job for the king. He believed that David was there because the king wanted him there. So he gave him food. He gave him provision because he thought, I am helping the who? The king. I'm being loyal to you, Saul. I'm doing what is right. Then Amalek answered the king, and who, and, and who among all your servants is so faithful as David? You know, he is. Who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard? And he honors your house. He's, he's a good guy. Is today the first day that I've inquired of God for him? I, I, I've done that before. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father, for your servant has done nothing of all this much or little. And the king said, You shall surely die, Amalek, you and your father's house. And the king said to the guards who stood by, Turn and kill that priest of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. But you know what his guard did? They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't kill. This is the priest. We're not going to kill the priest. There's no way we're going to kill the priest. So his guard refuses to do that. But who's there? Doag. Doag. But the servant of the king would not put their hands or to strike the priest. Then the king said to Doag, you turn and strike the priest. And Doag the Edomite turned and struck down the priest, and he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. The 85 priests were killed. And Nob and the city priest he put to the sword both man, woman, child, and infant, and ox, and donkey, and sheep, and he put to the sword... He would go back to the city and kill everybody. He would go back to the city, dog, uh, Doag would, and kill everybody. Verse 20, but one of the sons of Amalek escaped and fled to find David. And he told David what had happened. If you look at the end of verse 22... David says, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. All of those people were murdered because of David's fear, his rejection, his isolation. He crossed boundaries he never thought 
he would cross. And let me tell you, listen, when we cross boundaries that we set, and we say we'll never do it, but because of those giants we cross them, other people are hurt. Other people are affected. I remember resigning from Mount Calvary Church and coming home, and it came back to the lie I told. I remember how that affected my wife. So I know what anger and fear and loneliness and rejection can do. I trusted in myself instead of God. I took things into my own hands and tried just like David. And we all do that. And usually people that we love the most are those who get, get hurt the most. Now I tell you, all, that's, it's a long story, but it's a powerful story. And I mean... And certainly we can empathize with David at 22 years old and, and what he had gone through. And What do you think if David would look back at his life, what do you think he would tell us about that? I'll tell you what he would tell us. And we find it in Psalms again. Instead of running to his own self and his own strength and thinking, I can handle this, he, when he couldn't. And his life ended up causing not only havoc for him, but havoc for all of that whole town and all those priests who were murdered. If David could stand here today, I'm sure he'd tell us what the psalm, what he wrote was he said, The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. That's what we sang about in our song. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. That's what he would tell us today. That's not what he did. He didn't run to a stronghold. He didn't run to the person who could help him. He didn't run to God at that time. And so... I, I would ask you this morning, who are you putting at risk? Who are you putting at risk because of your fears and your anger and your isolation and your rejection that's making you cross lines you would have never crossed? But instead of running to God, you're running to yourself and you're running and depending on your own strength instead of God who is a stronghold. And let me tell you, a thousand years later, a thousand years later, listen to what is written. Come unto me. Come unto me and take my yoke upon you. And learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your soul. Listen, all the fear, all the anger, all the isolation, all of the rejection that you go through in your life, God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, to be buried, to raise again the third day so that you might be able to spend eternity with him. But that you, when you go through isolation, when you go through fear, instead of running from God, you need to run to God. You need to run to Jesus. You need to run to his word. You know, people get upset with the church, and what do they do? They run from the church instead of running to the church where they need to be, where they'll find Jesus, where they'll find. And so it's interesting. David would have said, Jesus would be my stronghold. He wrote that in the Psalms. God is my stronghold. But in the New Testament, Jesus, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, he is our stronghold. Come unto me and take my yoke. Even as a pastor, I didn't come to Jesus. I thought I could work it out myself. 
No. Brought nothing but heartache to me and heartache to my wife and family. Because I lived in fear, isolation, rejection, and anger. I was so angry at that man. It would be six months later, he would pick up the phone and call me and invite me to a breakfast and apologize. But by that time, it was too late. It was all too late. The ministry that I thought I would retire in, where I thought I would end my ministry, no, it wasn't. God has a perfect plan, though, even in the midst of those things, doesn't he? And so sometimes he allows us to go through those things to try to get us to see, listen, you're angry. You're angry. You're living in fear. You're living in isolation. You're rejecting me. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's pray. You know, with our heads bowed this morning, we are all in our lifetime, we're going to face fear. We're going to face rejection. We're going to think people don't like me. Sometimes we're going to even think God doesn't like me. God doesn't even care about what I'm going through. And that's going to cause us, instead of running to God and running to others who can help us, that's going to cause us to isolate. And when we isolate, then we're putting it all and thinking we can handle all this. And we really can't. Those that we really need and those we're pushing away from us. And we're pushing sometimes Jesus away. That's why he says, hey, come. Come, all you who are weary. Come, all you who are living in fear. Come, all you who are isolating. Come, all you who are rejected. Come, all you who are angry, and I will give you rest. Take me upon you. Let me help you. And I will give you rest. Father, when we think of David, we always think, when we think of his low part, we think of Bathsheba and killing her husband, Uriah. The Lord, at 22 years old, he faced the giants of isolation, anger, fear, and rejection. And he didn't handle it very well. He tried to handle it himself and made a mess and cost many, many, many people their lives. Lord, when we choose to run the other direction and run from you, Lord, it's not only us who suffer often, it's those that we love the most who suffer. So I pray, I pray for every person here today who maybe sits in the pew and they are living in fear or they're they're feeling rejected that nobody cares and that God you don't even care or they're angry they're bitter about somebody who hurt them or somebody who did something to them father there could be husbands and wives that see her today who are angry at each other and father Lord the only way for that to come to a better place is for them to come to you to take the principles of God's word and live it out in their marriage father it might be in, in between brothers and sisters it might be between family members Lord I don't know but there could be anger seething today because people have been treated wrong even sometimes we have seething anger because of what our parents did to us or how they treated us when we were growing up father But just like the answer in the Old Testament that David would eventually talk about the stronghold of God, the answer in the New Testament, come unto me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Father, that's why we need the gospel every day. That's why we need to come to you every day. It's in your name we pray. 
Amen. Please stand with me as we sing in closing, God will take care of you. Well, it's been great to be in the house of the Lord today and to worship, hasn't it? Amen. Amen. So I want us to close our service by turning to the person next to you and say, thank you for being here today. You're dismissed. Amen.